Hello and welcome to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. I am your host, Amanda Testa. I am a sex, love, and relationship coach. And in this podcast, my guests and I talk sex, love, and relationships and everything that lights you up from the inside out. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast today. We are going to be talking around healing after grief, healing after loss, and I am really excited to be talking with Kate Carson, who is just an amazing human. She's a teacher, a scientist, and a chemical engineer, as well as a sex and relationship coach, an activist for abortion rights, and a mom. And she has just so much wisdom to share here, and I really, what we we're just discussing before we started recording is really finding connection around taboo topics and really finding healing and pleasure again after abortion or baby loss or whatever it might be. And, you know, especially with all that's going on in the world and who knows at the time of this publication right now, it's June 22nd. So when this pod comes out, we are not quite sure what's going to be going on. And sadly, our view aid might be overturned. And so we've got a lot to hold. And, um, just giving space for all of that too, because it is intense. And especially I feel very passionate about this because part of feeling confident and free in our sexuality is having autonomy over our bodies and choice. And this is heavy. So we also are going to talk about finding pleasure again after it all. So because there is ways to find that in connection and finding pleasure again. So welcome, Kate. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm glad to be here. Yes. And I had the pleasure of meeting Kate through a coaching certification. And she is just such a brilliant, with words, such a brilliant woman and has just such a powerful story. And I'd love if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about, you know, kind of your story and really how the current events are affecting families and how, you know, yes, just how you became to be so passionate about this work. Absolutely. So a decade ago, 10 years ago, last, last spring, towards the end of May, I had just graduated with my master's. I remember going, going to my graduation ceremony, wearing that like big gown and, uh, and getting heat stroke right away. Like before they even started the ceremony, just sitting at the side and getting heat stroke and having to like go home and call it a day because I was pregnant. I was quite pregnant when I, when I graduated with that degree. And I, had actually chosen to get the master's instead of a PhD because I was Mm -hmm. deciding to invest more of my time and energy in my family. It was only about a week after that, that I went to the doctor to have an ultrasound because I I had just had a horrible feeling about the whole time. And I was trying to have a, a birth center birth, like a natural birth. And my midwife kept being like, great, we're like getting all excited. I was like, I still feel like this is a disaster. And she was like, okay, okay, we're just going to give you an ultrasound. You're going to be able to come in confident knowing your baby's okay. So I went to this ultrasound by myself. Um, and it took a long time, it took like an hour. And at the end, two doctors came in and they said, we are so sorry, but your baby has brain malformations. Her brain didn't form properly. This is like quite a serious thing. We can offer you adoption or we can offer you abortion. Oh no, we might be able to offer you abortion, but we just don't know. I was 35 weeks pregnant. And then they said, of course, otherwise we're going to like fast track you to the high, high risk. And you're going to get a neonatal neurologist and you're going to, they're going to give you a C-section. It's going to be like, boom, 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 intervention, intervention. But I just remember them saying adoption, abortion, and being like, do they have the wrong room? (laughs) do they have the wrong room? I had had three miscarriages trying to get pregnant with this baby. And I was finally pregnant with my second daughter. I had a two-year-old at the time and just feeling like my world was falling down around me. Further testing revealed that my baby had Dandy Walker malformation and agenesis of the corpus callosum. And what that means is she had two separate brain anomalies. Either one of them is sort of a spectrum disorder, has a wide variety of outcomes, but the two of them together and each of them presenting kind of severely. The prognosis for my baby was that she would not walk, talk, eat, or swallow. So she would be significantly disabled. And when the doctor was telling me this and he was telling me all the things she wouldn't do, I remember just sort of taking a deep breath and looking at him and being like, what will she do? Like, what does a baby like my baby do? Does she just sleep all day? Like if she can't do all of these things, does she just sleep? And he winced and he said, babies like your baby are not often comfortable enough to sleep. So there I was 35 weeks pregnant. Um, And I remember telling my genetic counselor, like, this is very sad, but if she can't eat, if like she really can't swallow, then we know what we want to do. And it's a, we, we, no interventions. It's awful. She's going to die of starvation and dehydration. And she was like, oh, 
you can't deny a baby a feeding tube. That's not legally a possibility here. So my obstetrician called me and she had found me a healthcare provider who does provide abortions at this stage in pregnancy out in Colorado. And I am from Boston. So I am surrounded by medical care, medical schools. And my husband and I had to get on a plane. We had to fly to Colorado and we had to show up with $25,000 to get this abortion. It's a four day procedure. And I did not know if it was legal and I did not know if it was safe. I just knew that I was up against, you know, intervention for, for my baby. Her name is Laurel. Intervention for her and her condition. It would have been painful. It would have never made her well. And that just wasn't the life I wanted for her. So I ended up getting an abortion between 35 and 36 weeks of pregnancy, which is a very extreme thing to do because I was in very extreme circumstances. Yeah. And since then, I found a support group. Thank goodness. There's something about peer-to-peer support, especially for something so unusual and so misunderstood as later abortion. There's something about people being like, we understand. We've been there. You're welcome here and you're safe here. Very quickly, after a few months, I started doing modding for that support group. And so I've been mod and admin of ending a wanted pregnancy for almost a decade, almost the whole decade I've been a bereaved mother. That means that I've held several thousand moms and dads through this exact same situation. Not necessarily, I mean, mine's extreme dates wise. But, you know, through getting a diagnosis or through having a maternal mental health crisis and not being able to see your way through the pregnancy. So something medical comes up, some crisis arises, and the pregnancy is just not tenable anymore. And that's really why all pregnancies are ended. There's a pregnancy. Maybe the pregnancy itself is the untenable piece, but there's this thing that's just not tenable. And so that's really why people end their pregnancies. So... That has, is actually what brought me into coaching, holding people on a volunteer basis for so, so long and seeing the problems. And this is a baby loss community. That's how I would describe yeah. it is a baby loss community. These are people who, whose babies died, right? They died in the body and they died with a choice, right? Of the timing or, or of the death, but they died. And so holding these mostly moms, but some dads and couples for so long has really shown me that. There are huge consequences to that in terms of sex, love, and relationship. It puts a huge strain on relationships to try to navigate a shared loss because we expect there to be shared grief. And there's just not, it's not, not possible as far as I'm concerned to share your grief with anyone. Grief is very lonely, but we have no, we have no examples for that, right? Like you look around and there are really no examples in, in media and books of, of couples who lose together, usually when you lose one part of the couple is feeling it more than the other, but this is really a shared loss. And then sexuality too, there's this real phenomenon of disembodiment, right? It's like a kind of dysphoria, actually. It's like a kind of dysphoria in the body where all of a sudden you hate your body. I am one of those lucky people who never had an eating disorder. Like I have a very healthy relationship with myself, my body and with food my whole life. That's pretty rare for a woman, but After my loss, after I lost my baby, I just wanted to unzip my body and float out of it. Like I hated my body so much because I really was putting all the blame for building a broken baby on my body. There are consequences in your sexuality from that. And in love, it's hard. Sometimes we self-punish and we don't let ourselves love ourselves. We don't let ourselves receive love. So it made a lot of sense for me to go into sex, love and relationship coaching because I saw these big gaping wounds that weren't necessarily being being competently addressed in the world of baby loss support. Yes. Well, I just want to take a moment and just, you know, hold some space for all that you've been through and also just honoring Laurel and your beautiful work that you've done all these years too in holding other parents who have been through similar experiences where there's a loss. And like you say, it's not tenable in some way, shape or form. And it's, you know, I think too, honoring the different ways people grieve. And I appreciate how you said, you know, grief is a lonely thing because everyone does process differently. And I think knowing that no matter, and if you're listening and this is resonating in any way, or just also for the listeners, just holding whatever might be coming up in you, because, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, is that grief is a huge topic and it can be so encompassing. 
and having that feeling of your body betraying you in some way. I know I talk with a lot of clients that feel that no matter what the situation of like, my body is broken me or something about it has made me disconnect. And whether it's through grief or loss or illness or whatever it could be, you know, finding that road back to yourself and to process all that you've been through is not an easy road. And so that's one of the reasons too, why I feel like it's so important to have these conversations and to be aware of the support that is out there. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. At this moment, when I'm in my baby loss space, when I'm in the ending a wanted pregnancy support group, one of the hard things about this particular loss is that it's so politicized, you know, loss by abortion. I call it abortion. Some people Some people, even in the group who've gone through this are like, no, it's a termination. And I really respect their choice around their words. But for me, my story is an abortion story, but it's just so hard to feel like what word you choose determines whether or not you'll be held in your community, determines whether or not people will try to put you in prison, determines in some cases, you know, whether or not doctors might treat you fairly when they look at your record, right? Like it's really scary to have something so personal be so politicized. So it's a fraught time. It's a fraught time for my support group right now and for my clients. I mean, and I can only imagine how much more fraught it it is about to become. Yeah. And that to me, I just like, I have no words. Yeah. And I just feel like this huge clenching in my whole throat and chest and body. It's like, ugh, it's just so disheartening. And so when you feel like these, like, yes, it's a personal choice, but it is very politicized. And I feel like our personal choices should not be politicized, no matter what they are. And so how, you know, I'm curious, what advice are you giving to the people in your groups now, or just anyone with a womb who might be facing choices that they want to be able to make and might not have the liberty to do so? Right. So if you're post loss, I really recommend insulating. I really recommend not just receiving whatever the computer and the phone and the radio want to give you. (laughs) So one of the ways that I did that is to call my brother and to call my best friend from childhood and to be like, I need you to please tell me, like if there's abortion relevant news, I need you to tell me what it is so I feel safe to turn this off. Like I will get a call. I'm sure 10 years later, I won't have to remind them. I will get a call from one of them without having to check myself if when Roe v. Wade gets overturned. And that's just like learning how to ask for help in general is a wonderful thing. Making it specific is very helpful to the person who wants to help you. And this is a beautiful place to help protect yourself because you don't owe anybody full access to your emotions. (laughs) So if, however, you are worried that you may need abortion support in the future, just even the medical procedure right now, just, we had a few States already strike it down. So Texas, I think you can get an abortion up to six weeks, which is insufficient for almost for many, many people, Oklahoma, and then Missouri, there may be more, but just three States in our country shutting down access to abortion care has already overburdened clinics. Like the one I went to in Boulder who now have five, six week long waiting lists, maybe even longer since I last talked to my provider. So I would say a resource that you should know about is NAF, National Abortion Foundation. They have a hotline that you can call to sort of get an idea of who's taking patients, what is the wait list. They will not refer you to anyone sketchy. So please, if you are looking for out-of-state care, always call NAF first. Because unfortunately, the less legal this is, the more sketchy providers there will be. I hate that that is the case, but it is the case. Abortion, when performed legally by experienced practitioners, is much safer, actually, than carrying a pregnancy farther. It's much safer than a a supposedly healthy live birth. So it should be a safe procedure, but the less legal it is, unfortunately, the less safe it's going to be. Yeah. So I would would just say that that's who I would start with. Unfortunately... People in states that you may feel you're safe in are affected by this too, because now fewer clinics are serving way more people. So you also might just want to be aware of the NAF. Please, 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 if you're in a state where abortion is illegal, don't ask your doctor. Please don't, because even if they support you philosophically, it puts them in a weird legal bind where they don't want to go to prison either. So please, please 
Protect your own privacy, even with your medical providers, especially with your medical providers. Protect your own privacy with your friends and family. Only talk to people about this who you know are going to show up for you and people like the NIF. That is beautiful. And that's beautiful advice that I think is important. And I might not be aware of, like not everyone might be aware of that. And I, you know, and I'm wondering too, when it comes to kind of healing post-loss, how, what are some of the things that can help on that road to healing, the healing path after abortion, after infertility, after baby loss? Mm. So I remember going through this and having this realization that I did not know how to mend a broken heart. I did not know how to heal my heart, but I knew how to heal a body. And so this is coming right up against that sensation that I hated my body. And it was, this was its fault. My body couldn't do it. It built, it had three miscarriages and then it built the baby all wrong. Right? Like that is not scientifically accurate, but that was my emotional understanding. So I had to basically make peace with the body first. And though I couldn't do it, it's not like you flick a switch and you suddenly are nice to your body. I knew some actions I could take that would be kindness to my body. I have a beautiful friend, Margot. She's also an admin at ending a wanted pregnancy. And she says, you know, sometimes eating the ice cream is a kindness to your body. And sometimes it's a cruelty. Sometimes going for a run is a kindness. And sometimes it's cruelty. Sometimes having the glass of wine is a kindness. And sometimes it's a cruelty. So really feeling in your body for what is kindness and what is cruelty to the body. I would get up every morning. I am not a runner. I'm like, I hate running. (laughs) I would get up every morning once I was cleared because I was postpartum for a while. So after like two months and I would go to a field and I would just run sprints. I I didn't want to like go for a long run, but I would like run across the field and I get all breathless and I just calm down and I do it again. And then I would like do some yoga and cry. (laughs) and and just like sob and then I would do a few more sprints and then I would go home and it took about a half an hour I think I only maybe six sprints it's not that much I didn't go that far but it was it was a way we work a lot with with trauma responses in coaching and I think this was literally like giving embodiment to my flight response there were so many times on my experience especially when I was trapped in medical areas like when I got that diagnosis when those doctors came in and told me my baby was not okay. I had a flight response that I had to suppress. When I got on the airplane to go to Colorado, I really didn't want to be doing that. I wanted to be running away. And it's so much you're like trapped in the seat. There's literal seatbelt, feet are in the stirrups, right? Like getting your cervix dilated, your feet are in the stirrups and it hurts. And I just wanted to run away. And so this was almost every single day giving me the somatic experience of running away. For some people, it might be beating up a punching bag or a pillow, right? Whatever the body wants to do, letting it do it. And that kind of exercise also felt like a sort of healthy way to like, if I had the self-punishment inclination, at least I wasn't like really harming my body. At least I was like just making my lungs hurt because I was breathing hard. Okay. Okay. And then I would feel better. Would I feel high vibe? No. (laughs) But the days I did that little running and stretching and crying routine were sad days. And the days I didn't do it, I was so deep and dark that I thought I'd never get out. So that's a difference, right? When you can actually be with your sadness, that is a difference. Another thing I would say is asking for help, learning exactly how to ask for what you need from your friends. And I gave an example of that earlier with the media, but a lot of people, when you've gone through a loss and they know about it, not everyone knows about this kind of loss, but because sometimes it's a secret, but if they know about it, they will call and they'll be like, oh, if only there was something I could do. I know there's not anything I could do, or if there's ever something I can do. And you just, at that moment, you're like, yes, yes, there is. You think of something. I, I remember asking a friend, would you please call me every Tuesday night at seven? And I can't promise I'll pick up, but would you just do it for a few months? And another friend like, yes, come take me for a walk on Wednesday. I have no idea what I'm going to be like, but please come take me for a walk in the woods. Nature is another one. Nature is a huge resource because you can belong to nobody, but you still belong to nature. And as for the couples, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard, but don't measure your grief by your partner's grief. My grief was messy. I couldn't hold down a job. I was a wreck, right? I like would cry and fall on the floor. You know, I was getting out of bed to take care of my two-year-old, but other than that, I was barely functioning. My husband, 
goes to work. I don't know what he was like at work, but it probably wasn't that different from the way he normally is. And he'd come home and he'd just sort of be like, I could tell he was scared. He would look at me and feel afraid, right? Because he didn't even know me anymore. So when I respect my grief, I'm not measuring it against his, my low functioning, his high functioning. I'm not being like, I'm an insufficient person because he can still go to work. And when he looks at me and is afraid, that's him measuring my grief, right? I don't internalize that. I let him have his feelings. He can have fear. He can be afraid. Heck, if I'm honest, I'm probably afraid too, right? (laughs) But being like, okay, I respect myself so much that I am going to fall on the floor crying. And I respect him so much that I'm not going to yell at him for not caring about our baby because he's not. Very powerful and very self-aware. I think that to even have that, because that's probably not easy for everyone, right? I will tell you, I did a lot of yelling at him for not caring enough about Laurel to grieve before I figured this out. <laughs> so it's not like I got straight there. <laughs> yes. Well, and I also appreciate the really specific things for people to do for you, because I think that extra piece there is So just like allowing yourself to be held, even if you might not want to be held at the time, you're like, I have, call me at seven on Tuesday. I may or may not answer, but if I'm available, that would feel really good. Or, you know, help me for a walk. May, who knows how I'll be, but just show up and be with me. Right. And I can, you know, remember some times of grief where I had friends and I would just like sit on the trailhead and cry for three hours and my friends are just there. And that's what you need sometimes. Right. It's like, Totally. Just to be held in whatever your experience is and not having to change it, not having it to be any different. And that is a talent for people to be able to do that for your friends, like to be able to offer that, right? You don't Completely. have to just be there, right? In, and it supports the partner too, because my husband was like fatigued by having to witness me cry so much and worried he would never have any happy moments with his wife again. So when I could turn to other people, I call this casting a wide net. Instead of just putting it all on my husband, okay, tr- I've friends. I have friends from high school. I have friends from college. I have friends from my community. Ask Mm -hmm. them to show up. They want to show up. Tell them how. For some people, they're not going to want so much contact. They're going to want to retreat. And so asking for Mm -hmm. space is the thing, right? But exactly. yeah, if you're able, if you're one of those fine people who's able to just be in the presence of a friend who's crying for three hours, oh my gosh, what a gift. What a gift it is. Yeah. And I'm wondering too, you know, being able to hold your own grief, like isolate as you need, like really protect your own self in the ways you need to, which I really appreciated your tip around not looking at news, like having someone share with you news and just really allowing yourself to be in your experience. And I'm wondering, you know, so those are kind of some of the the starting steps that you went on to be able to kind of be kind to your body again, or how to slowly start to heal your body. And I'm wondering what came next after that? Well, I... I do think there's space for pleasure here, many different kinds of pleasure. And you'll find that grieving people often, they, when they start to feel pleasure, they reject it quite violently. Like, for example, like they'll catch themselves laughing and be like, oh no, like I can't laugh because it means I don't love my baby, right? If I'm not all grief all the time, I must not love my baby. That's very normal. You shouldn't feel bad or wrong if you do that, but just notice, right? Notice, notice that we can laugh even when we grieve. Notice that sometimes it doesn't feel the same as like a belly left did before, but like there's this special morbid sense of humor. Totally got me through. Totally got me through the clinic, <laughs> right? And I laugh a lot when I tell these stories. It's, it's, not, it's not all self-protection. Part of it is that it's, I'm allowed to hold it. But then there's the physical pleasure as well. Like I'm lucky in this one way. And it's that my husband and I, probably because we're, we were pretty bad verbal communicators at the time, but we could, I could enjoy intimacy with him. I could enjoy physical touch from my husband. And so we actually made love a lot more than at other times in our lives. That is a minority experience. Most people actually have huge long dry spells after this. So both are normal. I would say like 15, 85% split wise. Either way, I'm not saying have sex if you don't want to have sex. That is the no, the real no is absolutely important. But to begin to notice where you're shutting down pleasure because you feel like you don't deserve it. What pleasure can you accept? Go accept it. It might be as simple as sitting in the sun and feeling the sun on your face. I think that is very powerful. And also knowing if you're someone listening and and maybe having a hard time, then you can reach out for professional support. And if it feels like you are denying yourself any 
joy or pleasure. And, uh, and also honoring like the time it takes, right? The time it takes to, to move through things. And also, at the same as you mentioned, honoring, we can hold multiple things at once. Absolutely. It can be both grief and pleasure in whatever way feels accessible. And like you say, even if it's just being able to enjoy a breath or being able to feel your body experience warmth or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. And I will tell you that one the turning point for me, because there was, there was a single moment that was a turning point for me. And it was, <laughs> ironically, it was when I let myself feel all the way sad. It happened in September. And I know it must have been September or October, because I just remember this like bright red orange tree against the blue sky. Like it's very vivid in my memory. I just dropped my, I just dropped my daughter off at preschool, which is a house of horrors for bereaved mom. <laughs> brand new preschool with all the babies and pregnant bellies everywhere. And I was walking home and I was fighting in my mind. I was like having a debate or a fight. I, I used to play like almost as though I was on trial. Like I would play this imaginary loop of me on trial for what I had done, which is torture, right? It's horrible. I might've been doing that, or I might've just been like getting really jealous or angry, but there was a lot of strife in my head. And finally, just like seeing that tree and seeing the sky and stopping at the top of the hill and being like, I give up. Okay. Okay. I give up. I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel it. I'm going to let it in. And it sounds silly. I really thought I might die. I really thought that my sadness might kill me. You know, I thought I might just drop dead right there or maybe really float out of my body. It feels that scary. And I, I got this vision of like, a tidal wave of grief and sadness, just like an ocean of sadness pressing down on me. And I was at the bottom of all of this water. And then all of a sudden I was floating to the top. And then all of a sudden I was looking around to the horizons, just like water in all directions. And it was just this knowing, knowing that my sadness was boundless, that it was as big as the universe and that I was big enough to hold it. Yes. That just gave my full body chills. Not. It's one of these things, Amanda, where I'm sure, I'm sure when you coach, you have had people make realizations like that. I'm sure you know what I mean. Yeah. And we don't get to stay there. I don't get to stay floating on the sea of my sadness. It's such a peaceful place. Like it's deeply, beautifully peaceful. I don't get to be there all the time, but just knowing that it's there, like knowing that I did it once and I could go back, it's life changing. Exactly. It's like knowing that you can be with that and survive. And I'm wondering that after that turning point, what, what else shifted for you? So one of the things that, what's funny, I did not have good therapy at this moment. (laughs) I had a therapist. She was so nice. Like, I don't mean to say she's not a good therapist, but she was not for this. Right. And she, she was just someone you talk to. I have plenty of people to talk to. I write, like I've got plenty of people to absorb my words. So it was not really helping. But what I noticed is that a lot of the things I came up with when I went through the training, I was like, oh, that's what I figured out. And that's what I figured out. They're all like well established trauma strategies. So when I look at this one, the sort of sea of my sadness, one of the things that became very clear was that. I had sort of split into a bunch of personalities. And I don't mean, I was not schizophrenic, but I had become aware of my subpersonalities around this trauma event. And the one that was giving me the most trouble, I call her my guard dog. She's like, sort of a bitch. (laughs) She's a real nasty, nasty girl. And she like, so mean to everyone all of the time. And I was really wishing that she weren't in me for a long time. But what this did was it showed me, oh, this is what she's protecting. She's protecting this vulnerability, right? The asking her to step back, like I'm really ready to feel it. That that was another piece of this moment with the tree and the in the water was like, no, you know what? I'm really ready to feel it. I promise. She wouldn't have let me if I weren't ready, was not ready, but I was. So she stepped back and I felt it. So from then on, I could actually make a relationship with this part of me. So when I find myself being really nasty and mean and angry and like vicious, I'm like, oh, there she is. And I love her. I love her because she's there to protect me. And if I didn't have her, I might just have my vulnerable places on display all the time, which would not be healthy and well integrated. 
So that's one way it changed for me is like now, okay, I'm going to deal with myself a piece at a time. And I'm going to learn to appreciate what my parts are doing for me. And this is internal family systems, <laughs> but, but it's just yes. like out of necessity. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's also Tantra. It's like parts work, right? Exactly. I think it's so interesting how wise our bodies and beings are. <clears throat> Even mm-hmm. just, you know, like you mentioned, you might not have had the therapy, but you figured things out. And then when you learn, you're like, oh, wait, I was doing this. But also just that wisdom of your body in the from day one, like trusting, like something's not right. I need to listen to what my body's telling me. Yeah. Right. And really trusting that and letting, trusting your timing, trusting your body's um, when it's ready to feel and that it can. And when it's not, that that's okay. Like just, we have our own timing. We have our own way. And we can hold it all, even though we think we can't. And we can only go. Like we can only go as fast as the slowest part of us is ready to go, right? We've, that, is the, that is the truth. And I'm wondering too, you know, and it sounds like for you, you were in an experience where it did feel okay to, you know, have sex with your partner and to feel connected in that way. But for those who might feel like sex feels really heavy or scary, yeah. what, might, what might you offer for those people? Really good question. First of all, one of the reasons it might be scary is because you're afraid of getting pregnant again. And you're also afraid of not getting pregnant again. Right. Yeah. So you can't win. (laughs) If sex is too tied to fertility in your body mind, it's just going to be fraught. So if you desire to be intimate with your partner, but it's like such a hard no around that. Sometimes I think as like a lot of the people I, I work with are like long married adults. I think we forget that like, it doesn't always have to be a penis and a vagina, right? And uh, some people who go through this also are, uh, got pregnant other ways, like by sperm donation or by IUI or by IVF. But like, sometimes we forget we who can get pregnant by having sex with our spouse that like, there are other kinds of sex that you could still have with your spouse that are not so high stakes when it comes to pregnancy. So one of the things I really recommend for people who are ready to feel pleasure in the body is oral sex, is massage, is making out for a long time, cuddling, hugging, spooning, foot massage, like get it way out to the extremities if it's too scary to be in at the the root of you, right? And then a self-pleasure practice too, because another source of fear, we are in a postpartum body after this loss, after this particular brand of loss. And the postpartum body is not the same as the pre-pregnancy body. There can be a lot of, I think, fear that you'll find something different, emotions to process when you do find something different, right? So taking it so slow and just meeting yourself exactly where you are. Not so much comparison to the way you were before. There's this very simple exercise where you would like run your fingers on your arm or in any part of your body and you can change your perspective. You can be in the fingers. I'm I'm right now running my fingers over my forearm. And if I'm in my fingers, what I feel is like a little roughness towards the wrist and then softness towards the elbow, a little bit of, I can feel the hairs. And then I can be in my arm. And what I feel is like the gentle stroke of my fingers that kind of like really intricate. We do this all the time when we're children. Make yourself a child again. I mean, I know we're talking sexuality, but just like bring it back to the basics. Like as though you have a body for the first time, how are you going to explore it? I love that. And just like re-exploring your new, because every day we're like a new body in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, how can I just be curious and, and, and explore what I am today, who I am today, what my body is today. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And I think too, you know, what's so important, and I think I've heard you mention this, is like really finding a community of like-minded individuals like to support you, like peers, people who have been through something similar just so that you can get the support you need. And so I'm wondering if you might share some resources or how potentially people can connect with you to work with you and yeah, what's available. Absolutely. So you can work with me 
my company is Night Bloom Coaching. So you can find me at nightbloomcoaching.com, N-I-G-H-T-B-L-O-O-M, coaching, C-O-A-C-H-I-N-G.com. Uh, I do one on more, one work. Sometimes I do group work. I'm expanding my offerings. So we'll see. Occasionally I run retreats. I am one person. If you would like peer to peer support from many people, I help run the group ending a wanted pregnancy. You can get in. It's a Facebook group. So fortunately you have to have Facebook to join it. And you would go to the website, ending a wanted pregnancy.com. And there's a application form. If you are not into Facebook, then I think the Reddit TFMR support, TFMR stands for Termination for Medical Reasons Support, is an excellent forum. It's very well moderated. It's actually moderated by an abortion provider. So unlike the one I, I, we don't let you ask medical questions in our group, but you can ask medical questions in that space. He's not your doctor, probably, but it still is, is great. There are some, like, for example, there are a bunch of Instagrams. HG loss, hypermesis gravidarum loss is a handle on Instagram. That's for hypermesis, hyperemesis is when you throw up a lot. It's pregnancy sickness. We hear so many triumphant stories of women who overcome that, but in some people's bodies, it is so severe and so scary that they really have to end the pregnancy to be safe and survive. One of the Bronte sisters actually died of her hyperemesis. So it can be a very, you can have organ failure. It can be a very, very serious diagnosis. But so if you are, have experienced that kind of loss, definitely check out Janai Hyper MS HG loss on Instagram. There's the TFMR doula. She's based out of Mexico and her name's Sabrina. Who else have I got? I'm there's sure to the, add all these two in the, um, yeah, in thank the show you. notes for people. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a UK based podcast as well. T- TFMR time to talk TFMR. Beautiful. So those are the, the basic places I would recommend. Also, if you've gone through a loss like mine, You belong in general infant and pregnancy loss groups as well. Unfortunately, just because you belong doesn't always mean you'll be welcome. Unfortunately, I I hate that that's true, but this is a great time to ask a friend for help. Would you please find me a support group, call ahead and make sure I'll be welcome there. Mm, Yes. Very good. And I'm wondering too, if there's maybe a question that you wished I would have asked or anything else that you want to make sure that you share. I think... You know, it's a sad, mine is such a sad story, right? Like I, I lost this daughter and it was scary and frantic. And we're, I'm telling it at a time where what was once rare is about to be common. Like people are tra- already traveling all over the country to have abortions. Pretty soon it's going to be even worse and accessibility is going to, it's very easy to feel like really freaking sad and that's appropriate. But I also just want to talk about, there are gifts to this. And I'm not trying to shine the turd. Like, I'm not trying to be like, oh, look at the silver linings of my dead baby. (laughs) (laughs) But there are gifts. And I, you never need to be grateful for losing a loved one ever. That never has to be part of what it means to be grieving. But I would encourage everyone just to accept the gifts that come. Like, you know what? This isn't what I thought I wanted, but I've earned it, right? You know, I have. I have earned my ability to sit and listen to hard things. I I don't think I was such a good listener before this. I have earned a much deeper compassion and appreciation for all sorts of hardships, right? But I have also earned, and this is the thing that is sort of surprising. I am happier now than I think I would have been if this hadn't happened to me. I am also sadder. So I feel like the richness of my emotions just got deeper and more colorful because this happened to me. If it hadn't happened, I wouldn't have had to go through this shit, right? Like this horrible, <laughs> I wouldn't have had to walk through it and, and feel so uncomfortable for so long, but I actually do get to live a richer life on the other side. It doesn't matter. I don't have to be grateful for that. I don't have to be like, well, I'm glad this horrible thing happened, right. but because it did like, I am committed to living it deeply. Yeah. And my marriage too, you know, it was strained. It was stressed and strained for a couple of years there. It was very, very hard. And I'm really glad. I'm really glad I came out the other side. Not everyone, just because my marriage lasted. And I think it's great. doesn't mean that everyone should. But when things are really hard, (laughs) wherever you are, the only thing I can promise is that you will be somewhere else soon. Yes, that is true. I'm wondering, well, first of all, I just want to honor you and the, all the work that you've put into and all the, that, you, that you've done to be with yourself and to move through 
you know, and heal and to keep living, right? Keep moving forward. And also in, in your relationship as well. And I'm wondering maybe if there is maybe, maybe just one small tip you could share in, to, in, with relationships and, you know, moving through yeah. grief, like what, and this type of grief in particular, what supported you in your relationship or maybe what's one thing people could do? Yeah, definitely the casting a wide net. And it's counterintuitive because you'll read a lot of relationship books that are like, if you're going to your friends instead of to your partner, like you, this is terrible. It's not terrible that we are undergoing more than any one person can hold, including ourselves. Right. So, so really (laughs) reconnecting to, to many, many layers of community, family, and cultural support is the best thing you can do to support your relationship. This, the other best thing you can do because, well, because what it does is it gets you the support you, that you need. And I will tell you, it is a million times better to get the support you need from your second choice, third choice, 500th choice person than not to get it at all. So you really, really showing up for your needs and letting yourself have needs mm-hmm. is the best thing for your relationship because it takes the pressure off of the partner. Mm-hmm. So good. I love how you mentioned like, yeah, even if it's your 500th choice, you need to get what you need. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And just like, as the more I learned to love myself in it, the more I could look at my husband and really love him too. Like until, until I was okay with me, I couldn't be okay with him. And it, it, I don't know what he was doing on his end, but it felt like I was the one who was like strategically improving the relationship. And I think that's probably the case. It don't, it really, it, If the relationship is coming from a healthy place, which ours was, it only takes one person to start in the right direction. If the relationship is unhealthy, then that may not be true. And definitely trust your instincts and and stick up for yourself and do what you need to do. Yes. Well, thank you so much again, Kate, for being here. And I will again make sure to share how everyone can connect with you and work with you. And thank you for the beautiful work that you are offering the world. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to see you again. Just, I love to be on your show and I love to see you and talk to you. Thank you, Amanda. Yes. And for all of you listening, thank you for being here. And please, if there's someone who you think could benefit from this episode, please share. And yes, be good to yourselves and we will see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. This is your host, Amanda Testa. And if you have felt a calling while listening to this podcast to take this work to a deeper level, This is your golden invitation. I invite you to reach out. You can contact me at amandatesta.com slash activate. And we can have a heart to heart to discuss more about how this work can transform your life. You can also join us on Facebook and the group Find Your Feminine Fire group. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends. Go to iTunes and give me a five-star rating and a raving review so I can connect with other amazing listeners like yourself. Thank you so much for being a part of the community.